everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city Hollywood. We are moving to uh, what what I call um, intelligent treaty systems, um, which we see happening in a lot of the different treaties that I follow, um, which involves uh, a combination of technologies from sensing technologies to cloud computing, storage capabilities, uh, and data processing uh, capabilities through machine learning and and um, uh, artificial intelligence and and then uh, modeling and visualization kinds of tools. And so what we see, and and finally then calibrating the results, from the various treaties based on indicator frameworks and, and targets that um, I, I mentioned earlier. And what we see happening is that these systems, because many of the individual technologies have been around for years, but what's happening is that they're working together. And that is enabling us to get near real-time data availability, but it's also comprehensive, it's global in scope in many cases um and it's more precise it's more um detailed um and it's searchable and it's open source in many cases so it's it's available to anyone in the public to see it this empowers potentially citizens to you take that data and to use that data the resources that are available if you look at things like the microsoft planetary uh, computer. You have access to all of the Landsat data going back decades. You have Sentinel data, You tools. The, the, the possibility for influencing the process um, is really increasing faster than I think we've become aware of at this point. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Thomas McErney, international lawyer and strategist. Welcome to the show today. Hi, Scott. Nice to meet you, and thanks for having me. So you're currently the executive director of the Rule of Law for Development Program at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. I wonder if you could tell us about your role and some of the courses that you teach. Sure. Um, I teach courses in uh international law uh, and uh, at the intersection of international law and development. Um, and I've worked in the field of uh, rule of law, which is understood to involve improving countries' capacities to achieve good governance and reliability of domestic institutions. Um, and it was based on that work that I got really interested in treaties as a particular um, contributor to countries' uh, overall development process. Now, the topic of, topic of treaties, I was going to just say, is it's it's always been a very important bedrock when it comes to international relations and, and governments. Uh, but never before has it become so important and paramount as we talk about climate action. Uh, I wonder if you could just give us a context about how the legal framework and treaties specifically helps with some of these sustainable development uh, initiatives. Sure. Well, I think uh, treaties and, and my interest in treaties really grew out of the central role that they play in the international governance system that we have. Um, and if you pick any major problem affecting the world, um, certainly this is true in the environmental context, there is typically a treaty associated with it. Um, and treaties by their nature are legal instruments. And um, while in international governance, there are a lot of different ways that 
um, initiatives can be developed, for instance, soft uh, standards, codes of conduct and things of this sort. Um, a lot of business uh, initiatives, certainly in the ESG space, you see a lot of um, voluntary practices happening. But mandatory international law is binding on states. And so they have a legal obligation to comply with uh, treaties. And it's based on that that I, I, I think that they're an important uh, contributor to the overall global governance system. So certainly, whenever possible, we, of course, self-regulatory or self-governing is going to be ideal. But to have the ability to have treaties is essentially having kind of like teeth in a way. So you have enforcement as well as the monitoring and actual carrots and sticks that goes along with it as well. Now, you've uh, advised NGOs, governments, including the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, UN Environment, Biodiversity International, and the World Health Organization. I wonder if you could go into some examples of how you've applied some of these strategies and solutions to enhance the performance of some of these global regulatory systems. Sure. Well, um, yeah, I've worked in a, a variety of different um, uh, areas of international law and work for a variety of different kinds of institutions. And, um, you know, one of the things that comes up, as you say, uh, the, the question of, is a, a mandatory treaty the best way to um, address a particular global uh, problem or not? That's usually a threshold um, kind of uh, consideration. Um, but in terms of thinking about treaties and how to um, uh, how to improve their performance and their contribution to uh, sustainable development, I've been involved in a variety of situations where um, treaties have, let's say, been underperforming. So, for instance, um, have not uh, lived up to their full potential. And the question is, uh, you know, what are ways to to enhance uh, that that performance? Um, and one of the ways that I've seen uh, different treaty uh, bodies, because treaties are overseen by their member states, um, so the the um, individual states within uh, the international system, um, and what I've seen. Uh, states do is um, uh, use strategic management as a tool to help improve the management of uh, these uh, instruments. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about, in many cases, uh, legal instruments that have more than 100 uh, different countries that are that are parties to them and so the process of managing uh the instruments are, are very uh difficult and, and complicated so, so let's take so, uh, so i wonder if you could go into a little little example so that our audience can understand better so let's take the example of cop or the paris agreement uh, the predecessor as well as the current standing and how the 100 plus member nations that are part of that uh, really have not necessarily come through their side of their agreement in terms of carbon output, carbon reduction, for example. So how are some of these strategic management helping to make sure that the treaty is binding and that these different parties or state actors are actually held accountable? Well, actually, in, in if, if we're talking about the um, Paris Agreement, we're talking about the Climate Change uh, Convention. Um, so far, the kinds of strategic approaches that I'm talking about haven't been applied in the climate change context. One good example of where they have been applied um, is the Convention on Biological Diversity. And um, I've been following the use of strategic management by treaty bodies for a number of years. And the Convention on Biological Diversity um, has applied a strategic approach to managing uh, its processes um, and now have done this three times and in December uh, approved a, sorry, December of 2022, approved a new biodiversity framework for that convention. Um, and what has happened in that process is that the 
uh, process of developing a strategy for the convention has really helped um, bring together all of the different actors involved in the treaty in a way that um, hadn't been possible um, previously. Um, and what it does is it allows the treaty body to set um, targets, set clear objectives, um, and it gets everybody involved on the same page. So um, the priorities, the objectives for the treaty for the coming uh, decade are spelled out and are understood. And then for all of the activities involved on the ongoing uh, meetings of the parties and things of this sort, the strategy constitutes the kind of, not kind of, it is the framework on which all of those other processes are structured. So it's that kind of thing that I think um, could be useful. Uh, potentially in the climate change context, but hasn't been uh, applied as such uh, thus far. Okay, so a couple of questions. One is, um, what's keeping us from using that type of a legal tool? And secondly, going back to the example of biodiversity, can you get into a little bit more granularity in terms of what is that treaty like? Um, what is the monitoring process and how is it systematically ensure that uh, all the different parties are in fact adhering to that treaty and meeting the goals and the objectives? Sure. Well, um, there's no, uh, strictly speaking, in terms of the Climate Change Convention, there's no um, in, um, legal impediment to undertaking a more strategic approach to uh, implementing that, that uh, convention. Um, and it is an extreme, I mean, one of the uh, reasons that it may not be um, on the agenda at this stage is the complexity of the climate change agenda. I mean, it's, it's extremely uh, 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 broad, covering all aspects of the international economy, et cetera. So um, that may explain why, and, and there's so many things on the agenda at each one of the COPs that um, I, I think that there are too many other competing um, issues to have had this kind of an approach uh, be applied thus far. But um, in terms of the biodiversity treaty, one of the weaknesses of that treaty has been the lack of a strong compliance mechanism. Um, and the use of strategic planning was actually a means of helping to um, substitute for a um, compliance system for the treaty. And what the parties did was, rather than looking so much at individual state compliance um, as to whether a given country has fulfilled all of its obligations under the treaty or not, they are looking at the treaty overall and saying, are we meeting um, targets globally uh, for certain priorities? And they've set specific targets that then become the basis upon which a whole slew of um, initiatives to monitor uh, biodiversity progress uh, are undertaken. Um, and so it is, a, I think, a, a, a good practice. At the same time, there are limitations to these things. And I think this, this question of compliance that, that we've hit on here a few times, I think that we have to um, be uh, judicious about how, what we can expect from compliance in international uh, agreements, because a key part of the international legal system is the autonomy of every state um, and their sovereignty. And the, um, the ability of international institutions to strongly force states to adhere to all of their obligations, even if they've undertaken the legal commitment, is uh, rather weak in, in many cases. So we need to try and um, take approaches that um, prod, that encourage, that um, incentivize states to um, uh, do the th what they've already committed to uh, doing. And this kind of strategic approach that I described is, is one way of uh, helping to facilitate that. 
Okay, so this is, I think, at the heart of what we're talking about. And again, the, the context of what we're discussing is really around your book, Strategic Treaty Management Practice and Implications. So clearly, there's very critical importance on this. And this, you know, although we're talking about the case of biodiversity, this gets into anti-corruption, money laundering, any type of human rights and uh, things that we're seeing from, you know, let's say, even chemical warfare, for example, uh, and then, of course, the kinds of bits and pieces of the climate action that could potentially fall within this if we do decide to pursue it. But staying with uh, the the core of what you just shared is that you're right. Um, is that the treaty, the the strategic frameworks helps us from a multi states to rationalize a certain set of goals and objectives. But is ultimately, it's up to the individual sovereignties to be held accountable to themselves effectively. What are some of the mechanisms that the strategic management allows that helps to spur or encourage or prod in the absence of some of these compliance and enforcement uh, tools? And well, and and I think that's that's a, a, a um, good way to put it. Is is that um, there are um, different tools that uh, encourage that can be used to help uh, encourage states to comply with their uh, treaty obligations, and a lot of those things are happening at the national level. And so, one of the ironies of international law is that states agree to bind themselves to a particular treaty, um, but that then domestic actors may call upon the state to fulfill the obligation that they've undertaken. Um, and what then those domestic actors can rely on these kinds of strategic frameworks that I've described. Um, and one of the things that's grown out of these uh, processes, um, I, I mentioned the Convention on Biological Diversity and the monitoring system uh, in terms of the targets that were set with that, is that there is a whole lot of research uh, that's being done on the topics relevant to the uh, various treaties that um, provides a lot of information, a lot of data that citizen groups in countries can use to uh, lobby uh, or protest or um, um, inform their governments in ways of uh, in, improving their adherence to the the uh, obligations that they've undertaken. And, and and this strategy is very smart because instead of external factors, you have domestic constituencies that are effectively advocating or lobbying for adherence to these treaties, whether, again, we're talking about social injustice, environmental destruction, disease, or poverty, or any of these subjects. Uh, ultimately, the citizens are holding their governments accountable for it. Now, the other aspect of that, aside from the data, open data governance aspects, and we'll get into technology in just a few minutes, is uh, this notion of uh, economics and, and, and capital, is that many of these types of initiatives one way or another, have something to do with capital. So, for example, when the international monetary policy or other types of world banks get involved and these sovereign nations are looking to grow a certain economic industry and they're looking for the aid of these government-backed types of capital structures, how does that somehow tie into these treaties in a way that adhere to the treaties? Because if they do comply they're more likely to qualify for some of these types of capital structures that's going to be necessary for their growth. The financing is a critical element to to all of this. Um, and because when we look at the world, I think, um, you know, if you come from, from the U.S. or Western Europe, and there's uh, a sense in which uh countries have resources and they can they can use all of those uh, resources to live up to uh despite the fact that many times they don't but in theory they can live up to their international obligations for a lot of countries in the world they don't have the uh, additional uh resources to be able to um do so um and so built into um a lot of these processes and certainly 
a key component of a strategic approach to treaty management is to uh, make financing a priority uh, from from the beginning. And so one of the things that I've seen happen is that the use of strategic uh, approaches to treaty management has been a way of then structuring the financial uh, um, uh, resources that are made available for a given treaty, but then are the basis upon which countries can seek that financing. And then they put it into action in within their domestic development programs. And they use the financing uh, opportunities, the windows that may be opened uh, to support the treaty process. They use that within their domestic uh, development processes. And that's critical because especially when, if we're, if we're talking about climate change and you're talking about how, to, how do you make the transition in the economy to a more uh, green uh, uh, system, uh, the, the financial uh, flows needed to make those kinds of changes are, are, are massive and, and, and integrating them within the domestic uh, development processes is, is critical. Can you give us some concrete examples of how some of these are implemented and the kinds of success metrics that you've seen over the years? Um, can you be a little bit more, uh, which, uh, yeah. So, so again, I, I think, you know, I'm thinking about our listening audience and the, the general framework of strategic management maybe still too broad. So trying to get down to some case study that can help to exemplify how some of these things have actually been deployed and the kinds of success factors or metrics that's come out of it as a result. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll give you an example, again, uh, looking to the biodiversity example, because it is one of the more developed approaches of strategic uh, management. And one of the things that I think has been uh, most successful in that in that process has been the uh, development of the research to support the knowledge agenda around uh, biodiversity. And so one of the things that the um, treaty has done is develop um, over time a process for uh, creating a flagship report reviewing the global biodiversity outlook and that that those reports are tied to the strategic framework that have been developed for the treaty and so and and the reports involve the uh use of technology and science um really uh, very strongly in terms of the development of the uh, of the reports, you have large groups of scientists, um, thousands and thousands of scientists from around the world collaborating and gathering the raw data to support the um, uh, to support the 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 knowledge needed to generate uh, these reports. And what the scientists are are doing is that they are aligning their research with the needs of the treaty process uh, in many cases. So looking, for instance, to measure uh, specific environmental trends based on indicators that were developed for the treaty. And as a result of some of the major technological uh, innovations that we've seen over the past 20, 30 years, uh, things that you're intimately uh, familiar with, Scott, are what we see is that um, these technologies have enabled vastly uh, increased amounts of data and um, scientific knowledge that then feeds into the treaty uh, process. So it's useful both in um, understanding the global context of how uh, the biodiversity situation is, but then uh, it's useful in calibrating the results under the treaty and helping 
to identify where there are um, deficiencies or where things things can be improved. So it's serving those two those those uh, the twofold processes, and it's um, and 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 really the the treaty has has uh, I think achieved some important uh, uh, progress uh, in terms of helping to structure the scientific um, uh, research communities work, uh, but then using that in the pro- in the deliberative processes. So just something that I, I just want to point out, because it, it, it may be assumed, but I don't think it was explicit, is that, of course, many of these research naturally, researchers are going to naturally find some of these topics of, of these interests within the treaties framework. Fascinating. However, it, you know, I think there is probably specific funding as a result of those treaties at a governmental level that is flowing to these public and private research institutions that's allowing for these researchers then to go deeper into the inquiry as well as the longitudinal studies of some of these biodiversity aspects, right? Uh, so the alignment has to be there and the funding has to be there for these researchers to focus versus, let's say, focusing on, on different topics that may be tangential, but not directly related to the treaty per se. To your point is that um, the data gathering is very important because it's providing almost this closed loop where the framework starts to become technology driven and data driven. And that in turn, like you said, comes back almost like a scorecard that helps to recalibrate, uh, refine and optimize the treaty and the set of goals on an ongoing basis based on the data that they're collecting. And again, the technology that we're talking about could be everything from computer vision to acoustics. We had marine scientists that actually listens to the underwater creatures uh, to get these big picture views of how things are happening from migration to climate change impact, for instance, to the kinds of sensors that are out there that's capturing not just climate, but also the movements of birds and even species. And of course, on a satellite level, we're starting to see lots of big picture perspective, including wildfires, flooding, heat domes that we're experiencing uh, more recently, for instance. Clearly, we are starting to get to a point where we're starting to almost create a digital twin of these treaties where it becomes very much live. And in some cases, yes, we could wait for those final reports. There's also an opportunity to be able to monitor on a real-time basis as well, right? And when you have real-time basis data, and this goes back to what you said before, is how does that help inform those domestic citizens to be able to use and harness that data to keep their governments and their elected politicians accountable to these treaties? Well, that's uh, you covered a lot of ground there, and and I agree with a lot of uh, those points because that is exactly what's happening is that we are moving to uh, what what I call um, intelligent treaty systems, um, which we see happening in a lot of the different treaties that I follow, um, which involves uh, a combination of technologies from sensing technologies to cloud computing storage capabilities uh, and data processing uh, capabilities through machine learning and and um, uh, artificial intelligence and and then uh, modeling and visualization kinds of tools and so what we see and and finally then calibrating the results, from the various treaties based on indicator frameworks and, and targets that um, I, I mentioned earlier. And what we see happening is that these systems, because many of the individual technologies have been around for years, but what's happening is that they're working together. And that is enabling us to get not only, um, as, as you mentioned, in, uh, not always real time, but um, near real time data availability, but it's also comprehensive. It's global in scope in many cases, um, and it's more precise. It's more um, detailed, um, and it's searchable, and it's open source in many cases. So it's it's available to anyone in the public to see it. I think that standard of open source science. Um, I was just at a, a meeting at the group on Earth observations in Geneva, um, and we had a, a two-day session on open science and open uh, data, because that is really critical now um, to 
uh, the, uh, the the way in which our uh, international institutions uh, work in these in these treaties, and and I think that this empowers potentially citizens to you take that data and to use that data. The resources that are available, if you look at things like the Microsoft planetary uh, computer, you have access to all of the Landsat data going back decades. You have Sentinel data. You Any kid uh, who wants to uh, crunch the, this data and, and and study it can can do so and i think that the tools the 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 possibility for influencing the process um is really increasing faster than i think we've become aware of at this point uh and 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 so that's that's really exciting the looking forward i think we have to think about how do we change these treaty processes to make use of this uh, these resources that are now available thanks to technology, and do we do we structure things differently? Do we um, do we recalibrate our our uh, priorities on a more regular basis? Um, and how do we involve those citizens uh, in the processes? There's a big movement for citizen science, and there's more recognition uh, of that as an important uh, con contributor, as is indigenous and, and local communities uh, contributing their knowledge. Uh, but I think that that's where things are are, are going, that there is uh, greater opportunities for, for um, participation and, and helping to steer these processes as a result of, of having all this uh, data available now. Well, I'm very excited about the possibility of some of these uh changes or or impetus for dynamic treaty management in, in a way. Uh, so very mm -hmm. excited about that. But I want to go back to one last point, and we have just about a minute left, which is uh, in the beginning, you talked about the fact that there isn't really a treaty that exists today that specifically addresses climate action. And I would make the argument that within climate action, there is a lot of data, forensic accounting and data that's starting to become available and captured and recorded in systematic cloud type of a ERP system. And more so, perhaps maybe at a very overarching big picture, it may be difficult to kind of boil the ocean. But if we look at specific silos, let's say electric vehicles, hydrogen manufacturing to, let's say, specific types of storage or wind energy, there are I got to believe they got there are opportunities to create some of these dynamic treaty st uh, strategic treaty management. Is that right? What do you think? Uh, I I think certainly there are. Uh, I think the building blocks are are certainly there to uh, improve uh, the processes. In a lot of cases, though, the, the you know the big question is how do you get the policymakers to act. And, um, you know, we can provide all the data in the world and certainly climate change, you know, every IPCC report comes out, the science gets even stronger and more. But we see that the, the, the governments are not acting as rigorously as the data tells us uh, it needs to. So I think that um, the, the building blocks are, are definitely there. And I think, you know, like, again you're you're coming from the from the business world you know that the the potential for different technologies and different products is not necessarily appreciated when the products emerge so if i'm right that this idea of of intelligent treaty systems is actually um novel and a, a new contribution to um, the way in which we the we approach these agreements, we may be in the early stages of um, seeing how these technologies can be applied in the future. And I think that's uh, along the lines of what you were saying um, uh, is is put in the hands of creative actors, uh, you know, who are who are looking for new solutions. I think uh, the possibility is there, and we're starting to see evidence that these these technologies are are being built into some of the new uh, treaties that are that are coming down the pike. So uh, it's, it's exciting to see. 
So with that, I have been joined by Dr. Thomas McErney, Executive Director of the Rule of Law for Development Program at the Loyola University of Chicago School of Law. Thank you for joining today. All right. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.